AP Statistics. In this video, we are in Unit 3, and in the book, we are continuing, continuing Section 4.2. So this is designing experiments. So we're going to talk about how we design an experiment. So there's lots of vocabulary. Again, I know you're totally pumped about that. All right, so in an experiment, we need to talk about a control group. So what is a control group? Well, this just provides a baseline for comparing the effects of our treatment. So in other words, if I work at a drug company and I've created a new headache medicine and I think it's better than the one I already have, then my control group is gonna be the people who are receiving either the old treatment or I can use the control group for people as, um, receiving a placebo, which means they're not receiving any medicine. And then I'll have another group that does receive the medicine. So in other words, I'm using my control group to make a comparison based on how much or how effective the new drug is. Okay, so depending on the purpose of the experiment, a control group may be given a placebo, active treatment, or no treatment at all. So that's pretty much what I just said with my little headache example. All right, so the placebo effect, we talked about this a little bit, but this is where it's occurring in the notes. It's just used to describe the fact that some of our subjects in an experiment will respond favorably to any treatment. So let's say I come into class tomorrow and I'm like, kids, oh my gosh, I have discovered a new magic smart pill. And if you take it, you're going to ace every test you take. All right. And um, because of the fact that some of you will buy into this and you'll be like, oh my gosh, yes, let's do that. I could give you Tic Tacs and some of you would still be like, oh my gosh, I, I felt so much more confident on that test. Okay. That's what the placebo effect is. All right, so we, now we need to talk about blinding. So I told you we would talk about this a little bit more because it has to do with our placebo. Because if you're handing out a placebo and you're handing out the real drug, you don't want people to, you know, um, react to the drug in a negative way. Like if they know they're taking the placebo, then they're going to automatically know, well, this isn't working. So it kind of got the reverse effect that the placebo effect has. So you have to stop and think about the fact that, you know what, if I don't want people to know what they're taking, that means that I'm going to blind them. I'm going to tell them I don't know which drug they're getting, the placebo or the real drug, and then I'm not going to tell them what kind of treatment they're getting. So single blind means that either the subjects or the people who interact with them and measure the response variable don't know which treatment the subject is receiving. Okay, so that means that the people involved in the experiment as the subjects, either they don't know or the people administering um, the drugs to them or taking care of their um, the measuring, whatever we're measuring, et cetera, et cetera. So as a good example, let's say as a teacher, I design a new study method, all right? And I want to experiment and see if it affects how well you do on your next test. So if I am randomly assigning some of you to study with your old method, and I'm randomly assigning some of you to use my new study method. Well, if I know who's getting what method or who's studying in a certain way, might it affect how I grade your responses? It might, okay? So, but I can't blind you to using a new study method because you know which study method you're using. But I can be blind to which one you're using. Of course, there would need to be a third party involved that knows what you're getting so that at the end we can compare and see what kind of data we have. But that's one example of single blind. Double blind means that a third party knows who's getting what, but the actual subjects in the experiment don't know and the people interacting with them to um, take their measurements of whatever or distribute any kind of treatments, they also don't know. So a double blind experiment means that neither the subjects nor those who are interacting with them 
and measure their responses. Okay, so that's both groups of people don't know. All right, so when we look at an experiment, that one of the things you need to remember is that random assignment, okay, this is not like random sampling in surveys. This is random assignment. There's a reason we're using different words. So random assignment means that our experimental units are going to be assigned to treatments. And it's very, very important that you understand that this has to be by a chance process. There's no choice involved here. You're flipping a coin, rolling a die, picking numbers out of a hat, anything like that. It has to be a random assignment. Also notice that we want to randomly assign the experimental units or participants to the treatments, not the other way around. We're not randomly assigning treatments to the individuals. We're randomly assigning the individuals to a treatment. I know it sounds confusing, but it does make a difference. All right, in an experiment, remember that control means you're keeping all other variables constant for all of the experimental units. For instance, if I'm looking at testing a new weight loss supplement, well, wouldn't I want to make sure that I'm controlling everybody's diet to make sure that you're not eating something specific that's maybe causing the supplement to work or not work as well as it could be. So in an, in an experiment, we want to control. That means keeping everything as level and consistent for every participant as we can. All right, another thing that's important in an experiment is replication. And that just means that each treatment is going to have enough experimental units in order to um, actually be able to see that there is a difference in the effects of the treatments and that it can be distinguished from chance variation due to random assignment. All right, so replication just means, it doesn't mean what it means um, in other things that we talk about when we talk about replication, okay? Replication means that you're using enough subjects. Okay, so the four principles of experimental design are, we have to have comparison, and that can be in the form of a, having a control group or two or more treatments. So when we have a comparison, that means we want two or more treatments, and one of them can be a placebo. We must have random assignment. That is a necessity in order for it to be considered an experiment. And we must have a control. We need to keep everything as uh, keep all the variables as much the same for all the participants as possible. And then, of course, we have to have replication, which means that we are using enough subjects. All right, so as we learn to design a completely randomized experiment, we need to think about the different ways this can occur. So a completely randomized design, what does that mean? Well, that means that my experimental units are assigned to the treatments completely at random. In other words, if I've got 30 participants and I want 15 of them in my placebo group and 15 of them in my new headache treatment group, then I'm gonna put these 30 participants, I'm gonna put all their names in a bowl, mix it up. The first 15 I pull out are gonna go here. The next 50, or the 15 that are left over are going to the other treatment. All right, so that is completely randomized. Everybody's, ha everybody's name goes in the hat all together and it all gets mixed up. Now, something that's different is when I have a block. So a block is a specific group of experimental units that are known before the experiment to be similar in some way that is expected to affect the response. Okay, so what does this mean? Well, let's say, let's go back to my example about a new study uh, program. If I am conducting this new study program with some of my students, and I think that their GPA is going to affect how well um, they respond to this study program, I might wanna block them on 
GPA. Like in one block, I'll have everybody who has a GPA between four and six. In the other, I'll have everybody who has a GPA between four and three. And then a third block of everyone below that. So a block is just something that you decide on beforehand at the very beginning of the experiment, and it has to do with some characteristic in your blocks that you think might affect the outcome. So if I think age, um, gender, uh, GPA, um, class, uh, sorry, grade level, if I think any of those things are going to affect the outcome, I'll want a block, and then within each block, I make my random selection for um, participation in the treatments. So a randomized block design means that my random assignment of experimental units to treatments, treatments is carried out separately within each block. So I create my blocks and then within each block I do my random selection. Okay, matched pair design. This is a common experimental design for comparing. So this works great when you have two treatments, all right? So this means I'm gonna compare two treatments that use blocks of size two. So in some matched pair designs, two very similar experimental units are paired, and the two treatments are randomly assigned within each pair. In other words, each, each experimental unit receives both treatments in a random order. All right. So another good example of this, let's say I think that my study method program is going to, um, is going to be affected by GPA. So let's say I find everybody's GPA and I put them in order from the highest one to the least, okay? And then so let's say I've got names here and they're in order from the greatest one down to the lowest one. So what I'm gonna do is take these top two kids here because they have a very similar GPA. So these two kids, I've got kid one and kid two. All right, I'm gonna flip a coin for kid one. If that coin lands on heads, they're going to get my new study program, all right? And then the other kid is going to use their other study method, and then we're gonna take a unit test. For the next test, I'm gonna switch these. So for the next test, this kid is gonna use the study uh, method and this kid's going to use their original study method and we're going to take another unit test so that I can compare kind of apples to apples instead of apples to oranges. That's how that works.